Hi, I'm Peter Cohen, and I'm a part-time lecturer at Babson. I teach in the management division, both in the undergrad and uh, grad parts of the uh, strategy department at Babson. And I'm really happy to be here today talking about uh, a new book that uh, Professor Rangan and I have written called Capital Rising. Uh, about April 2006, we got together in a faculty meeting, and I went up to him and said, Srini, how about if we write a book together? And he said, sure. And then he came up with this fantastic idea of writing it about the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we spent about uh, three years working on a book proposal, uh, basically talking to various publishers. And finally, we found a publisher that wanted to uh, work with us and do the book that we really wanted to do. So we started working on it. And here we are about a week before it's being published. And I'm very excited to talk to you about it uh, today. Um, capital Rising uh, is about the role of capital flows uh, and the way that capital flows shape the entrepreneurial ecosystems of different countries and the implications of that for different uh, participants in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, which include uh, policymakers, capital providers, managers in existing industries, and also uh, startup CEOs. So today what we're going to do is talk about uh, three different topics rather briefly. The first one is we're going to talk about uh, the actual uh, evidence of capital flows throughout the global economy. Uh, then we're going to talk about the entrepreneurial ecosystem, and I'm going to uh, ask Srini to talk about that since that's really his brainchild. And then uh, I'm going to come back and conclude uh, with a, a brief discussion about some of the implications uh, of this concept for the different stakeholders, the policymakers, the capital providers, and so on. So capital flows uh, have played a tremendously important uh, role in the development of entrepreneurial activity uh, around the world over the last several years. Uh, for example, just uh, between uh, 2008 and 2011, uh, there's been a tremendous fluctuation. Obviously, the financial crisis in 2009 has caused a lot of contraction in capital flows, um, but we expect them to come back. And if you look at statistics uh, from the UN and from um, the Institute for International Finance, what you see is that both of them expect a growing uh, a sort of rejuvenation of capital flows in the wake of the uh, financial crisis. So for instance, between 2009 and 2011, uh, the UNCTAD, the UN uh, organization that tracks these statistics, expects uh, capital flows to grow from 1.2 trillion to 1.8 trillion, and um, flows to emerging markets are expected to grow from about 531 billion to about 746 billion. So, despite, or in fact, as, as a response to the, the financial crisis, um, we're seeing a growing flow of capital uh, into countries around the world, and it's capital that takes many different forms. It's investment by businesses, it's private capital, it's, it's investment by hedge funds, uh, mutual funds, all sorts of capital flows that are basically changing the way businesses are created and destroyed throughout the system. And to expand on this concept of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague, Sriniranga. Hi, Peter. Thanks very much. I really appreciate uh, being here with you. It's interesting that you started with the notion uh, whether we, how we should write a book together. Uh, I still remember our conversation. Uh, remember, I asked you, look, there's a lot of capital flowing around. And you asked me, well, well that's a fact of life. What exactly are we going to talk about it? And my intention was, well, we can ask some questions. Why is this capital flowing? And if this capital flows along these li li lines we are talking about, what has been its impact on the countries and industries? And if it has an enormous impact on countries and industries because of the capital flows, how does it change? Uh, the uh, life of people, entrepreneurs, managers, and policy makers. And I still remember you saying, oh, that sounds a great idea. Let's move on with it. And uh, this is where I think uh, the, the idea of entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, came into uh, existence. Uh, as you can see, what, we, what I did was uh, I drew on what I had been working on for the last 15, 16 years since I left Harvard Business School. Uh, I have developed a course called Natural Business System. And the intention was to show how different countries have a different business environment. And those business environment dictate the kind of industries that they will grow, the kind of entrepreneurs they will create, the kind of businesses that will flourish. And those kinds of things had been my, my approach for a long time. But then I started also seeing this interesting phenomenon, the phenomenon called capital flows, global capital flows. As you rightly pointed out, going back to the uh, earlier slide briefly, you said uh, how Capital has been flowing since 19, 2008. It's projected to grow dramatically in 2011. In fact, you can go back. Remember, we talked about it. We can even go back about 10 years, and you can see how private capital flows to developing countries and emerging markets have been rising 
significantly for the last 15, 20 years. And what we are seeing is the movement of this capital having an impact on the kinds of industries uh, we are going to have, and the kind of uh, entrepreneurship we are going to have in different countries. So what I did was I sat back and developed a conceptual framework. The framework was fairly straightforward and simple. It comes out of a lot of research in sociology, in economics, in economic development, and more importantly, uh, in the financial economics. And my interest has always been, as Babson always uh, often prides itself in saying, uh, integrating various disciplines and coming up with a framework where we can use it to explain uh, a new and interesting phenomenon. The phenomenon here, we are looking at globalization of capital, how capital is flowing uh, fairly fast and in large quantities to countries where we did not even think previously they will be flowing. In fact, once given an example, about 20, 30 years ago, if you look at the United Nations the Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD people, uh, they were essentially talking about foreign direct investment, large multinational corporations, how much they are sending money to developing countries and putting up new plants and equipment like companies such as IBMs uh, and uh, Reynolds of the world. What is puzzling about the more recent flows is how we are talking about capital of the private capital, private equity, hedge funds, and mutual funds, and the kinds of things you talked about earlier, how that is flowing to these developing countries. The recipients of this capital are different from the recipients of the previous foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment basically means a large company goes into another company, puts up a plant, and runs it, and it's owned by the large multinational. The private equity we are talking about, private capital we are talking about, flow is flowing to companies, new companies, new entrepreneurs, or established companies in some of these emerging economies who are essentially trying to transform themselves in an entrepreneurial fashion. So what is interesting is for us is to say, what determines which country gets it? What determines which entrepreneur will get it? What determines which industry will get it? And then, next question, what are the implications of that? I think that seems, so once we started talking along these lines, and it, it yelled to me, my natural business system concept with some appropriate modification can apply here. That's what I call the entrepreneurial ecosystem. If you look at uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem model, it's fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, as you can see on the picture here, there are only four major factors, which I call institutional factors, which I put in there. The first is what I call human capital. In any country, you want to have a new entrepreneur to come up, a new business to thrive, and a new way of doing uh, business has to come into being. There must be enough trained manpower, and those people might be available. So human capital becomes a critical uh, factor. In fact, you can ask this question, uh, the, uh, what's the difference between a, a, a poor developing country and a rich country? It's basically in the human capital. Human capital significantly varies across countries. A country which can create human capital, which can take advantage of new opportunities, new ways of creating uh, um, uh, entrepreneurial ventures, is likely to do better than countries which don't have it. Also, if human capital is very strong, it's quite likely those kind of, the companies in those countries will be able to uh, get the capital providers from other countries to think in terms of investing. Take an example. If you think of Infosys, which is a great company from India, and this is a kind of company which is focused on IT services. And it's a global IT services company in which they are operating. Back in the early 90s, uh, this company, as it was in a growth path, needed more capital. They didn't have a, a lot of collateral. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have a lot of uh, 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 plant and equipment. This is a company which runs on purely intellectual capital, human beings, people who are skilled, talented uh, software programmers and software system developers and uh, system administrators and people like that. So with that human capital, Infosys was able to go to uh, the a large uh, uh, market in the United States and raise the capital it required. And that allowed human, Infosys to develop into a, a global corporation, which it is today. Clearly, an influence of entrepreneurship based on human capital, getting that bank, having the ability to raise the capital in another country and build it in India. The second feature I point out is in this in the entrepreneurial ecosystem is the role of financial markets. Financial markets are interesting. As the old saying goes, you know, the financial markets, particularly bankers, will be able to be willing to give you the money. Uh, when it sun, uh, they will, will give you the umbrella when the sun is shining. The moment you start raining, they will take the umbrella back. So entrepreneurs, on the other hand, needs the money when it is raining, needs the umbrella when it is raining, not when it is shining. So the question essentially is, 
what kind of financial markets will be able to willing to help entrepreneurs. Here there are some interesting things about the financial markets. We can think about financial markets which are long and deep. Financial markets which are able to assess risk better. Financial markets which are willing to take some risky bets and allow this kind of a entrepreneurial ventures to come into being. Think about this country, Google. Google did well, extremely well in the last decade. But if you go back to this thing, in the beginning of Google, we are talking about a comp two, two guys and who are essentially Stanford graduates who decided that they wanted to start a new company. Have no track record. They have not run companies before. They have never any, made any dime. They are essentially grad students at Stanford. But the financial market in this country, the venture capitalists had the ability to assess the riskiness of the proposal, take appropriate measure to minimize the risk, and yet fund this investment, fund this venture to grow into what is today a giant corporation in the world. So the financial markets, how they deal with these risky ventures and how, well, how they are willing to take bets on them and how they minimize the risk and yet fund the, the risky ventures is a way to think about creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem which is conducive to that kind of a capital flows. So financial market play a very important role. And that takes us to the next question, which is corporate governance. Now, you and I both know, Peter, if somebody gives, me, gives you money, that guy is obviously going to expect to be repaid at some point in time. There are not too many people in the, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the philanthropy business of giving money. So if you think about Google, uh, Google clearly was raising a huge amount of capital from the uh, VCs, venture capitalists, and yet they had to put in place right kind of a corporate governance practices which allowed the venture capitalists to be confident that this money will be appropriately used, properly channeled, will be used for productive purposes, allowed to make the value of the company increase, and eventually they'll be able to get repaid. And that's exactly what corporate governance role is. Corporate governance role is to provide the appropriate sets of incentives and safeguards for capital providers in order to make sure the capital providers feel comfortable about giving the money to the, the, pro, the prospective entrepreneurs. So an important role is corporate governance rules and systems. Uh, recently, with all this uh, financial uh, crisis and what we've been seeing in the Wall Street, uh, a hidden factor here is how effective corporate governance rules had been. And whether the corporate governance rules have been properly adhered to, whether they are flouted, that becomes a critical role, issue it's, uh, by itself. And countries uh, which are able to create appropriate corporate governance practices which safeguards the interests of capital providers is likely to attract more capital and thereby provide an attractive entrepreneurial ecosystem. That takes us to the last point, which is intellectual property regime. This is an interesting question. If you think back to the argument discussion I had about the point I made about Google and the point I made about uh, Infosys, one important question we should be asking, why did Infosys have to come all the way to United States to to raise the capital, whereas Google sitting here is simply just walk across the street to the venture capitalists and make the money and raise the money they want. The difference, I say, is intellectual property regime. India had for the last, and from 1970 to 2005, for 35 years, had a system of intellectual property rights, which essentially said, if you have an intellectual property, kiss goodbye to it. You will not be protected. India did it as a policy decision because they thought they will be, that's the way the Indian pharmaceutical industry can grow. They can essentially steal anybody else's ideas and build on it and create generic medicine. Perhaps it's justified from the Indian uh, government policymakers' perspective. They wanted to get cheap medicine to the Indian masses, perfectly legitimate. But the unintended consequence was it also meant companies such as Infosys could not protect their intellectual capital. They had no big protection. In fact, Infosys had to change its business model, which did not have to rely on intellectual capital. Many other industries in India suffered for a lack of intellectual capital, intellectual property rights protection, and therefore could not even probably did not even come into being. Google, on the other hand, could patent its algorithm. The guy, I think that the, the Google founders came up with was essentially a mathematical algorithm, where they were able to patent it, and that means having a strong intellectual property protection. A strong intellectual property protection meant the investors, the venture capitalists, could clearly happily feel my 
my five, my investment in this company will be protected because it's backed up by intellectual property. It also meant it can the intellectual property can be further augmented by future human capital development in this country, in this company such as Google, new intellectual capital will be created and that will also be protected. That also meant the financial markets feel comfortable about giving investing money in this company. That also meant we can have a proper corporate governance procedures which allows this, this company to flourish. So what you have is a highly tightly integrated set of factors for human capital, financial markets, corporate governance and intellectual property regime which fosters entrepreneurship in, in a country which also tends to attract the right kind of capital uh, to that country to, in, in the particular industries. In fact, what you can do is we can go one step further and think in terms of uh, what kind of a policy makers, entrepreneurs and managers uh, we need to think about or what they need to think about about the goals of these uh, various uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem participants. Uh, what I have identified in this particular slide is think about two sets of pay players, capital providers and policy makers. Capital is the lifeblood of entrepreneurship. If you don't have capital, if you don't have finite capital resources, there is no chance for an entrepreneur to thrive. What kind of capital providers? Well, we can always think of banks, but banks really don't are not in the business of investing in risky ventures as entrepreneurs start. People who do it are people who are providers of private equity, hedge for hedge funds, institutional investors, venture capitalists, and corporate venture capitalists such as the company that Intel runs. So those are the kinds of people who are critical for the ecosystem to really create value for the entrepreneurs and for themselves. Interestingly enough, on the other side are a group of people who can have an enormous influence on whether these capital providers will really do well, or alternatively, whether entrepreneurs will get the capital, or even more importantly, whether together capital providers and entrepreneurs can create ecosystem value for everybody. These are what I call policymakers. We are policymakers in Washington DC, we are policy makers in New Delhi, we are Washington policy makers in, uh, in Berlin and Tokyo. In every country there are policy makers who decide what kind of a capital market regulation we will have. In turn decide what kind of a financial market we will have. Uh, they will be the ones who will decide what kind of intellectual property uh, regulation will, take, will, will be in place. As I said, Indian policy makers chose not to protect intellectual property rigorously and that's exactly a policy kind of decision. Uh, they are the ones who will decide whether human capital will be augmented by new immigration. Uh, United States has been blessed uh, in having an immigration policy which has allowed the best and the brightest from all over the world to come here to study in top class universities and what is more important, stay here and create new companies and work to the benefit of themselves and for the entrepreneurial ecosystem in this country. Uh, the trade policy makers, uh, that they determine what kind of a, uh, global trade flows will take place and whether entrepreneurs who rely on global trade flows will be benefited. Uh, education policy makers decide what kind of human capital you will develop. Uh, in all our conversations in Washington DC and here nowadays where we talk about education uh, and uh, what, what we need to do in order to foster better education achievement in, in, uh, in schools, one of the important ideas which is missing is if we don't get that right, the entire entrepreneurial ecosystem in this country will be at risk. And that's an issue which policymakers have to constantly uh, to keep in mind. Uh, corporate governance policy issues, of course, is something which we all know. Uh, we can go back to uh, in the early 2000s when you talked about Sarbanes-Axley, which essentially is the one way of influencing the corporate governance. But I would go one step further. Corporate governance is not just simply about rules and procedures. Uh, you can write all the rules, but people will find a way to get around it. The critical thing is what kind of an ethical environment we create where people will play by the rules uh, for the corporate governance becomes very critical. Ultimately, when a venture capital sits, a venture capitalist sits in front of a, 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 an entrepreneur, uh, he, he or she is not thinking only about exact rules. They're also saying, can I trust this person to behave ethically and therefore uh, uh, deliver value? Policymakers have a role in creating an environment where the kind of a, uh, rules and procedures in an ethical environment can actually function. So what we have is an entrepreneurial investment system where the value is created not just simply by the, the previous uh, the, the framework I showed, but more importantly, it's also about having the policymakers and capital providers coming into play and helping the existing firms and industries as well as new firms and industries to change the direction in which they're going and how well they do.
That takes me to the next interesting question. I think you and I have talked about it. Uh, we, 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 when I said, when I mentioned something about uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem is not a static, it's a dynamic thing. Uh, you can think of an, an existing entrepreneurial ecosystem, which may or may not be uh, fully uh, functional, may or may or may not be extremely helpful to the entrepreneurs and capital providers. But as capital flows into those kind of uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, the new cap capital providers as well as the firms start influencing the and modifying on the political system. I give you an example. In India, when the government of India realized that the intellectual property regime was not helping the local entrepreneurs in developing to their full potential, what they realized was that we need to change it. And how did that realization come about? The very entrepreneurs and the very capital providers who are helping companies such as Infosys went and quietly lobbied with the government and saying that if we don't change the rules, we will not have a thriving entrepreneurial economy in your country. So the government of India took, took that kind of thing into, into, in, into, into, its, uh, into account and subsequently changed the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Lo and behold, entrepreneurial ecosystem changes to the better and it becomes a demonstration effect for the capital providers and now more capital providers flood into this country and start investing in even more companies. In fact, in India is a classic example. Back in the early 90s, capital providers, venture capitalists, private equity holders in the US and Europe were sitting outside and were not putting a lot of money in India. But once India opened up its economy, once it started demonstrating to the, the, the potential capital providers, they are really serious about attracting capital to the private capital into the, uh, into the entrepreneurial ventures in India and slowly modifying over a period of 15, 16 years uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem to be more and more conducive, more and more helpful uh, to the, um, uh, the potential capital providers and entrepreneurs, uh, India has started attracting more and more capital. Today you find in India almost every major venture capitalist operating. In India itself, locally there are venture capitalists who have come into being. There are hedge funds who are operating. These uh, uh, capital providers are investing in a number of firms in India with the result India is fast becoming uh, the mecca for uh, capital providers and is also a place where new, on, new entrepreneurs are coming into being. So it's a fascinating thing how a simple decision uh, by capital to grow itself, don't go to a particular place, itself has a second order effect changing the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And in fact, the, the, as you and I did this, you know, the, you, I'm sure you remember, uh, we started moving on some further and said, you came up with a great idea, said, hey, let's, can we come up with a way to measure it? Maybe you want to talk about this uh, uh, capital receptivity index. I'd love to. Um, thank you, Sri, uh, for a wonderful conceptual overview of this uh, book. Um, I was last week speaking at a conference uh, in New York to uh, pension fund managers and what I found very interesting is that we were doing the second panel, which was voted on based upon the interests of the people in the audience, and they were very interested in emerging markets. Um, I gave a little bit of a presentation on the panel about how $709 billion was flowing into emerging markets, and about 75% of that is equity. And the question that the people in the audience had is, how do you decide which country to invest in? And the interesting thing is there are other panelists who have made investments in private equity and emerging markets. Um, and when I showed this slide, uh, their eyes lit up and they said, yes, this is the framework that we need to use in order to decide which countries uh, to invest in. What's very interesting about the entrepreneurial ecosystem um, is that when you try to measure it, uh, and we came up with the idea of this capital receptivity index, which basically is a way of measuring how receptive a country is to uh, capital flows, um, what you realize is that some countries uh, are not really going to change certain aspects of their entrepreneurial ecosystem very rapidly. For instance, China uh, has a reputation, uh, well deserved I think from investors, of not really protecting intellectual property. The question is, given the growth rates there, and by the way, uh, China is the largest uh, recipient of uh, emerging markets flows, at least it was in 2009, with India being second. Um, there's so much growth in China that uh, private equity is flowing and equity uh, is flowing to China despite the fact that it doesn't have uh, a strong 
uh, performance on intellectual property protection. And what venture capitalists do is that they look at that and say, I'm going to accept that as a given for now with the hope that over time there'll be a demonstration effect which will cause them to improve their intellectual property protection. But for the time being, I'm going to understand that specific limitation about its entrepreneurial ecosystem in order to figure out which industries I should invest in. So rather than investing in a business that is very technology and intellectual property intensive, I'm going to focus on industries where um, it's a service business. It's taking the eBay concept and applying it in China or the um, Apple iTunes and bringing that to China. Basically something which is essentially a service business which does not depend on uh, intellectual property in order to be a, a successful business and to make returns for investors. And one uh, venture capitalist we spoke to mentioned one investment that he had made in a service like this uh, in China, which got the company a, a 100 to 1 return on its investment. And I found that to be a very interesting example of how using a capital receptivity index, which looks into the details of how do you measure the strength of an intellectual property regime, or how do you measure the strength of corporate governance, and applies that. Uh, to a particular country can help you focus on a specific industry sector that uh, is going to allow you as a capital provider to gain the greatest returns on your investment without uh, sort of stumbling on some of the risks inherent in, uh, for instance, investing in intellectual property uh, in a country where it doesn't have much respect for intellectual property, in which case there's a major risk that you'll have your uh, investment basically absconded with. So this is a very, very useful technique for capital providers. It's also useful for um, entrepreneurs who are trying to decide where should they configure their global value chains? Where should they locate their R&D? Where should they locate their marketing and sales? Where should they locate their manufacturing? And again, they can evaluate the um, capital receptivity index of each of these uh, countries, identify the strengths and weaknesses, and use that analysis to uh, position their global value chain in the optimal way. And finally, uh, what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about the different kinds of decisions that this entrepreneurial ecosystem allows the different participants to make. And what you can see from this slide is that what we can offer policymakers is very different than what we can offer startup CEOs. For instance, for policymakers, uh, we can use, they can use the entrepreneurial ecosystem to help them figure out how to attract private capital flows, how to encourage business investment into their countries, whereas for startup CEOs, this is a very useful framework for helping them to decide where to perform activities uh, in their value chain, uh, how to hire managers around the world, how to coordinate global operations, and where to seek capital. So basically, we've provided a framework, and in, in our book, we discuss uh, from the perspective of each of the different major participants in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the kinds of strategic decisions that we can help them make using the entrepreneurial ecosystem framework um, as, as a tool to help them understand most important decisions that they make in a slightly different manner. So with that, I just hope that you're uh, now interested in learning more about the book. And if so, um, we provide uh, a website where you can uh, take a look at more information about the book at Amazon as well as our uh, publisher, uh, Paul Grave Macmillan's website, which provides um, some examples of some of the very, very, uh, we're very grateful for some of the very positive feedback we've gotten from people in the venture capital community, people in the institutional investment community, uh, in, in the uh, regulatory area, as well as um, uh, professors from very prestigious places. So we're very pleased to be able to present to you uh, this work and hope that you're interested now in learning more about it.